our text from last week uh, leads us to think about and talk about the doctrine of e- eternal security or perseverance of the saints uh, or uh, maybe even better stated, the, the perseverance of Christ himself. But this is what we're, out of verses 13 and 14, this is what we're, what we're leaning into uh, this morning. It says, in him you heard the word of truth, the gospel of, the, of your salvation, and believed in him. So we've been talking about sort of this, this golden chain, right, of, of, of salvation, right? This where like the Lord, uh, the Lord knows us, uh, the Lord calls us out, we hear it, and we respond to that and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ as the only one true God of the universe. And we believe in him, and when that takes place, the scripture says that we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, until we actually get to the place of our salvation, to the praise of God's glory. So the question then is sort of like, what is the perseverance of the saints and how does that flesh out in the context of all of Scripture? And that's sort of the, the aim uh, of, the, of the sermon this morning. Like what, what, do we, what is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints? So the, uh, there's lots of uh, documents or lots of teachings, right, that help us define these things. Books have been written, uh, confessions of faith where people have gathered around, scholars and pastors have gotten around and said, hey, that, this is, this is a, a right definition. One of those is called the Westminster Confession of Faith, and they describe this doctrine like this. It says, they, uh, the people uh, whom God hath accepted in his beloved Jesus, effectually called and sanctified by His Spirit, can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end to be eternally saved. There, there it is most formally, okay? Uh, uh, Wayne Grudem, who is a, a, a scholar, he's uh, written a systematic theology, which is just a big book that sort of categorizes doctrines that you see in the Bible. Uh, he defines it like this. He says, all those who are truly born again will be kept by God's power and will persevere as Christians until the end of their lives. And that only those who persevere until the end have been truly born again. And so the question comes, well, why is this question even important? Why would we, why would we spend a whole Sunday morning trying to answer this question? Well, if the Bible speaks of a truth, uh, that we need to understand what that truth is and the implications of that truth. That's We are to love the Lord our God with all of our minds. And more specifically... If we were to not believe in this doctrine, in the perseverance of the saints, as defined above, then it may sort of call into question other things, like the power of God to actually save us, or the power of God to actually keep us. And that then would leave us, uh, at very least, maybe worried or uncertain about the salvation that we profess that we have. Or at very worst, it might leave us hopeless that we were never saved at all or safe at all in our salvation. Or maybe to go the, the other way with it, right? Thinking that salvation is independent of any sort of grateful response to the Lord, that we may falsely believe that we are being saved while being content, if not joyful, to live in sin. Because if I'm if I'm, if I'm really saved by God and I'm always saved, and now that I've got that covered, I can live however it is that I would like to, and it makes no difference to the Lord. Uh, both of these ways would be, would be bad. It would be a misapplication of the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. So let's, let's just look for a minute at, at the Scriptures that would, that would obviously affirm Christ's perseverance in our life, or the perseverance of the saints. So we see in the Old Testament, in uh, in a book of, of Psalms, right, chapter thirty-seven, it reads, "The steps of man are established by the Lord, when He delights in His way. Though He fall, He shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds His hand." So it seems to be somebody in relationship, and they've sinned, but they won't be cast headlong because the Lord will, per- will persevere in their life. Uh, the Gospel of John picks up on this theme in, in, in uh, chapter 6, 
And it says, all that the Father, this is Jesus talking, all the Father that gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Uh, uh, later in the same gospel, later in the gospel of John, chapter 10, Jesus is, is, is answering questions, and he says, he answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. This the passages like these are letting us know that the Lord saves us and the Lord sustains us and he keeps us and nothing can thwart that plan. The apostle Paul continues to write in this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 7 through 9 he says as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. We talk about the final day, the judgment day. You're waiting for the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're waiting for his return. And that, and that the person you're waiting for will sustain you until he comes back. And it says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Or he wrote to the, to the church at Philippi in chapter one, verse six, simply stated, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at that day of Jesus Christ. Work not simply being your morality, but the work of salvation in our lives. Hebrews chapter 7 says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Jesus, through him. Since he always lives, since Jesus always lives, to make intercession for them. Lastly, lastly, the apostle Peter, Peter, in chapter in his uh, his the first book, First Peter, chapter one, it says, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead." into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So these passages are telling us that, the, that God is saving us through Jesus Christ by grace, through faith, and that same grace and faith is keeping us and sustaining us until we either go to meet with him or the day that he returns, whichever comes first. And that once you are in that salvation, you don't lose that salvation. Now, this doctrine is sometimes debated because there's other verses in the scriptures the people read, they're kind of like, well, this sort of sounds counter to that, and I want to read some of those verses to you today so that we understand what we're talking about and to give a full presentation of the Scriptures and that we can try to explain those the best we can. So in, in a passage like uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, it says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. That sounds like I need to, as long as I endure, I'll be saved. Or John chapter 8, the same author who just I just quoted a minute ago. It says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. This is what I need to do to continue to be Christ's disciple. I need to, I need to abide in his word. Or later on in John 15, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. 
and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and are burned. So I, again, I need to abide in God. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So I here's the gospel that's preached, and I need to hold fast to it. Or Colossians chapter 1, it says, He has now reconciled you in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you, Christ is going to present us holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. So, so all these scriptures then are trying to teach us about what it means to be eternally secure in Christ, to have a confidence, to have a hope in Jesus Christ alone. And, and how it is, that, and, and, and if I am truly saved, is there any chance one day I'll be unsaved? Can I do something so bad enough that I would not be saved any longer, though I was truly converted at one point? Or is once I'm saved, I'm good to go? And what does that mean? Does that mean I'm free to sin like I want to? Does that mean that I'm free to do as I please? Because, well, Christ has me, so what difference does it make? What am I supposed to believe? These scriptures seem to be in contradiction to one another. Well, let me see if I can help us unravel it just a little bit. You ready? These scriptures would only be in contradiction to each other if you believe and are trusting in something you have done to secure your salvation. They're in contradiction if you think you have done something to save yourself and secure that salvation. Because if you're trusting in something other than Christ or alongside Christ, in order to assure that you at one time were saved, then you most likely will have to trust in something other or alongside Christ to assure that you stay saved. Thus, you will read the latter, the second group of passages as things you must do to ensure that you will not lose your salvation. But if you believe that only Jesus, only Jesus, who, who, who entered into to human time and space through a, a virgin birth, that, that if you believe that Jesus who lived a sin, sinless life, that Jesus who died uh, in our place on the cross, that, that we don't have to pay the, the price for our own sins, if you believe that that Jesus raised victoriously in resurrection, and that these things give his church their, its hope of his sure return, if, if you believe that only Jesus is the all-powerful, all-knowing God of the universe, then it is reasonable then to think that he saves you and that he keeps you in accordance with the scriptures that we read. Both sections. So, so you say, well, well, Pastor, I'm sort of starting to track with what you're saying a little bit, but, but how then do I, do I interpret or understand these verses? Uh, surely I'm supposed to follow what the Bible says to do, so I need to keep myself in the faith. Right? I need to walk. I need to follow Christ. Well, certainly, certainly you should follow Jesus and only Jesus. But when we read them, we should think about it like this. As opposed to keeping yourself from damnation, right, from hell, as opposed to you saving yourself, and keeping yourself and making yourself eternally secure, these things you are to do, this abiding, uh, they actually, we begin to see those things that they are actually the reveal the salvation bought for us by Christ's blood and are given to you by Christ's grace. 
So what I'm doing is I am allowing the power of God and what he does in salvation to to be the governing truth over the things the Bible calls me to do. The things the Bible calls me to be. Surely I should be obedient to God. Surely I should follow all of his ways. Surely I should abide in him. That should be my heart's desire. Because that's the heart that Christ gave me in order to follow him. And had he not given me that heart, I would have no desire to follow him. Think about it like this. At Christmas time, at Christmas time, like you, you might get several gifts, but there's one gift, like it's the best gift, isn't it? Like you, like, like, like you might get a bunch of stuff. Right, you get some socks, some undergarments, right? You get some, you get some things that you, you know, that you, you sort of, they're gifts, but you, your parents sort of know you needed them, right? So you get those things. But then there's the best gift, right? For, for, for the, for the child, it's, it's the one they play with the most. Like as parents, you're trying to figure out what to give them. And like, you know, you, you gave them all this stuff and then here's a box and they're just playing with the box. You're like, well, there's the best gift. There you go. There you have it. Right? For the student, for the older student, right? It's the one, it's the one gift they really wanted. Like that one thing they had their, their, their mind on. For the adult, it's, it's the thoughtful one, right? It's the thoughtful gift. Like, oh, that means a lot to me. You put some time and thought in that. But, but the best gift, the best gift you get on Christmas is the one that you never thought you could have. Right? It's the one that takes you aback. It's the one that you, you can't believe it's sitting in front of you. It, it might even be so thoughtful or so meaningful, it might even cause you to cry. It's the one that lets you know that the giver knows who you are and knows truly what you most want, and you're overwhelmed by that. Your spouse remembers something from 20 years ago, or your your parents just knew what, what, what you really wanted most, but whether you were afraid to ask for it because of where your family was at the time. See, Christ has given us this gift. And it's the most meaningful gift we could possibly have. Sometimes when we talk about it in terms of, of our spiritualities, the Bible tells us that we were dead in our sin and our trespasses. So it's not only like a gift you get at Christmas, but deeper still, it, it's, it's like somebody, like your heart is, is no longer working and somebody would give you their heart. What would you do? if somebody gave you their physical heart? Wouldn't you thank them or their family profusely for the sacrifice that they gave up their life so that you could have your life? Wouldn't you just be forever grateful? Wouldn't you tell folks about that? Wouldn't, your, wouldn't part of your life story be like, I was on my deathbed, but this person who I barely even knew, they just gave me their heart so I could live and they died. You would tell that story all the time. You would cherish it. You would, you would not eat fatty foods for the rest of your life because you got a second heart. If that were my story, I would not eat Chick-fil-A anymore and you would know how precious it was to me. You would make sure nothing happened to it. You would be sure that it would always be yours for as long as it would last. But you didn't give yourself the heart. You didn't keep the heart. It was just given to you. And now you're going to treat it like the most valuable thing you had. This is our salvation. You did not save yourself. You cannot save yourself. And you surely can't sustain yourself. Christ is the one that secures your life. He's the one that keeps you in your salvation. So you might hear this and be like, okay, maybe you're saying to yourself, okay, I'm I'm almost there. But as a a Christian, I've got some experience that seems to go counter to what you're, you're preaching right now. Like there's people that I've led to Christ myself or I've, I've witnessed them making a profession of faith in Christ. And I, and I even witnessed their life changing. They came to church. They were reading their Bibles. They, they, they made testimony of what the Lord was doing in their life. They, all these things, they did this for, for weeks, for months, for years. And then all of a sudden, they just stopped. They just went away. 
They're no longer following Christ. And now they, they, they may be even living in sin, and, and they may even still call themselves a Christian, but, 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 they're, but they're not living the way the Bible says that we ought to be lived. So, so what, what, pastor, what do, what do I do with that? Did Christ not keep them? Well, my, my first instruction would be to listen to the words of Christ. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So there's clearly a category for people who will profess Jesus as their Savior and Lord who aren't truly saved. This ought not make us suspicious of each other, right? So we're not, we're not going around trying to do some foolproof test to see who's right and who's wrong and who's lying and who's not. What the Bible says is those who are doing the will of the Father, those are the ones who are the, are, are the faithful believers. They're not keeping themselves in their salvation. They're doing what their new heart that God gave them to do, to do. It, it, it's like the parable of the sower. Maybe, maybe you're familiar with that, right? The sower sows the seed. Some fall on a path. Some on rocky ground that never have root. Some among thorns. But they get choked out, and some land on fertile soil. Soil. Jesus says the first, the first one is snatched away by the evil one. But the second one, the, the second falls w- whenever the hard times come. Right? So they say, oh, Lord, this is great. But then, then it becomes hard to be a Christian, and they sort of bail. The, the, third, the third says that they, they grow up amongst thorns, and they get choked out by the thorns. So there seems to be more of a longevity of time in that sense, right? But over the course of time, it's revealed that the things of this world make them not want to follow Christ anymore. And that's evidence that whatever took place three months ago or three years ago wasn't the real thing. It was for their conscience or for their peers or for, their, for themselves, but it, but it wasn't a transformed heart that God turned. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, it choked out their following Jesus. Let's, let's take one more passage of Scripture. Let's take one more. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. This is one of, the, one of the most, when it comes to this particular doctrine, this is one of the more notable passages of Scripture. Because Hebrews 6 says this. It says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away... It's impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. People read this passage of Scripture and they say, there it is. They were Christian and then they fell away to the point where they could never be saved again and now their life is hopeless. Well, let's break it down for just a second and let's see if that's what it's saying or if it's saying something else. Now, impossible means impossible. That's what it means. It means it cannot happen, right? There are three other times the, the, the word impossible is used in the book of Hebrews where it's impossible for God to lie, and we would say that's absolutely true. Uh, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That's obviously true. Only, only Christ's blood can take away sin. And it's impossible to please God without faith. That's right. You can't please the Almighty Father who you don't believe in. So it's impossible. Right? To restore that person to repentance. There's a true statement. But, but then again, what is, who is this person? Well, this person is enlightened. That means they're instructed. They're, they've been given instruction. They have some understanding. Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, later on, it says this. It says, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth... There no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. So then 
the receiving of the knowledge of truth is something that's falling short of actually being saved by God. It's a knowledge of the truth. It's a knowledge of of God who says, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But it's not actually being in relationship with him. So they've been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift, but but they haven't consumed it. It hasn't. They haven't eaten it. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. So it's it, it, is it possible to share in the Holy Spirit and not be saved? Seems to have happened at Pentecost. People come into our congregation. They share in what the Holy Spirit's doing among us, but they don't. They're not actually believers. It happens. They've tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. They've they've experienced it, but they're not regenerated. They're not transformed with a new life, a new heart. You have to believe that people are saved and kept. Uh, we see this biographically in, 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 our, in, the, in, the, in the Word of God, right? Uh, you can read the story of Balaam and see someone who's used by God but is not following God. The Scriptures seem to attest to this. Or, or King Saul who goes mad. Or even Judas, right? Even Judas presumably was sent out amongst the 12 and the 72 to go out and, and they did miraculous wonders and powers. Judas was a part of all this. He tasted all this. He was enlightened what the real realities were, but he never, he never had a transformed heart. He was a betrayer in the beginning. He's a betrayer in the end. You just saw it in the end. You, so it's impossible to restore them, right? You, it's impossible to restore them not because God isn't willing, but you can't restore them because they weren't saved in the first place and they're not willing to be saved. They're not willing to receive the free gift of grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you say, Pastor, but I, I, Pastor, I was saved just in my own story. I was saved, and then I definitely rebelled, right? I mean, I, I mean, I went and I sinned with the best of them, right? And then I came back to the Lord, and now you read me this passage, and I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe it's impossible for me to come back to the Lord because I tasted it all, and then I went away. Like, what, 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 what about that? Well. If, if you professed Christianity and you were in our church, and if you went off and just said, you know what, forget this, I'm going to sin like I want to, th- then our church would have treated you like an unbeliever. That's what we would do. We would say, hey, you need to come back to faith. That's what the Bible tells us to do. We would go after you. We would beg you to return to the faith. And if you did, great. And if you didn't, we would get some other brothers and sisters to go to you and say, hey, man, come back. Like, follow Jesus. And if you still didn't, we would tell it to the church so they could pray for you and encourage you and, and, and say, hey, man, come back. And if you still just refuse to come back, well, then, then, then we would actually, the Bible tells us, it commands us to put you outside of the church, to excommunicate you from the church, only for the purpose of shaking your conscience. To say that all these people who love you and care about you are telling you you are not following the ways of God. You're doing your own thing. And maybe your conversion to begin with wasn't real. But but if you're here asking me that question today, this isn't your problem. You're you're here either because your, your first round with Jesus was false and you knew it or, or, or because all those years you lived in rebellion against God, deep down in your heart, you knew you were sin sick and needed something other than the sin you were living in. Either way, God knew you were his before the foundations of the world, and God persevered in your life. Can somebody be saved and go away and and be restored? Sure they can. Were they saved to begin with? I don't know. What's their confession? 
What will they tell you? If they said, yeah, I got saved and I went and I just completely forgot about God and then I came back to them, well, I'd be like, well, maybe, maybe they weren't saved to begin with. If they say, yeah, I got saved and I went away from the Lord and I was miserable the entire time. I was having fun in the physical realm, but in the back of my head, I knew this wasn't good. I'm like, well, yeah, the Lord just, that, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I don't make that stuff up. You can't make that stuff up. If you're convicted in your soul that your sin is wrong before the Lord, then you're convicted in your soul by the Holy Spirit that you're wrong before the Lord. And the Lord's persevering in your life. He's telling you to come home. He's telling you, I've got you. I, I died for you. I rose again for you. I saved you. I will keep you. Stop doing what you're doing. It's foolishness. It looks like the world. Come back. And so then you say, okay, all right, pastor, if all this is true, if all this is true, then, then how would I ever know if I'm even really saved because I sin all the time? How, how, how can I have any assurance at all? Well, here, let me see if I can help. Let me ask you this question. Have you, in light of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done by his perfect coming, his perfect life, his perfect death, his perfect resurrection, his perfect ascension, and belief in the hope to return, have you repented from the sinful condition of your heart and trusted Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. If you have, not just by lip service, but in word and deed, the answer is you're saved. It's a really good sign. Uh, do, here's another question. Do you walk daily in the salvation that you've been so freely given? The salvation that's not accomplished according to your works, but salvation according to Christ's grace. Do you wake up every day going, Lord, thank you for saving my soul? Or do you wake up going, I better do some more things to make sure God's happy with me? If it's the, if it's the second, I'm not sure you're saved. If it's the first, I have much more assurance that you are saved. Because the Bible says it's only by grace that you're saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that none of us get to boast. That's the great thing about this church. You go to church here every single Sunday, and we're not walking around going, hey, how'd you do? How's this week? Are you, are you still in the game? Are you still saved? We never ask you those questions. Rather, we come to church, and aside from talking about the patriots or the weather, hopefully we get to the place where we're like, hey, how are you doing? And the response becomes, hey, I'm, I'm doing okay, man. Jesus is... Jesus is still real and alive in my life. For those who are tighter in relationship and they're close, they're able to say, hey, man, you, 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 it's your sin. You okay? Are you living in sin? We have people in our church who they ask each other those questions. And the response can be, man, this week, I've been super tempted this week, or I've really, I've really fallen in these ways. Or they, or they say, man, by God's grace, I'm not wrestling with that sin anymore, but I got this problem over here. Pray for me, brother. Pray for me, sister. That's somebody who's definitely saved because an unsaved person isn't even aware that they're sinning against God. They know they do some wrong things against their, their family or their friends, but they don't ever attribute the wrong things against Jesus. Let me ask you a third question. Are you bearing fruit? Are you not conforming to the world, but are you being transformed by the renewing of your mind? Like Romans 12 says. Are you sowing the seeds of the gospel in your spheres of influence and community? Are you telling people about Jesus? These aren't things you do to be saved. These are things you do because you are saved. You go into work and your first concern at the office is not if you got all your work done. Your first concern is are these people around you, are they followers of Christ? Will they spend eternity in heaven or eternity in hell? Because you're Christian. That's how you know Christ is preserving in your life, that you're confessing what the Scripture says about salvation and that you're walking daily in Him. For those who appear to be following Christ for months or years and they just turn away and never repent again, I have no assurance for their salvation. 
Someone who walked for months or years and fell away, and then on their deathbed, they make a, a true repentance of the Lord if they get that privilege. When I say they're Christian, I'd say, man, the Lord kept them the entire time because before the foundations of the world, he knew them. What are you being preserved from? If you're persevering in the saints, what is Christ preserving you from? He's preserving you from hell. He's preserving you from everlasting judgment. We believe here the Bible teaches that. And it's not about who's done the, best, the, the worst sins. It's about that we've sinned against Jesus at all. The Scripture clearly teaches us if you break one part of the law, you broke the whole law. What? Yeah. Yeah, it's that bad. And, and that kind of information will make you daily hopeless. If you're not being, if you're, if you're not persevering in Christ because he's persevering in your life, then hope, then you're daily, you're just like, what am I doing? I'm just on my own. But, but for, for as bad as you can make the bad news, there is greater news that overcomes the bad news. His name is Jesus. He loves you, died for you, rose again for you. And he's preserving you unto everlasting life in Christ. He's heaven. In his presence, forever, with no guilt of sin, no stain, no shame, no injustice, no conflict, just living perfectly in the grace of Christ, free from sin. We do internships here at the church, and, and myself and uh, Andrew McGarry, uh, who, who's not with us this morning because his wife, Eliza, has been sick. Uh, 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 just, just bad, had to go to the ER. Uh, she's okay, but had to go to the ER last night just to get, get things reset and, and move forward. So just be in prayer for them. But we're reading this book together called Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. It's a beautiful, it's, it's a really good work. But he talks about this everlasting life and this being eternally concerned. And this is how he, and, and I'm really thankful because it's not just a, it's the, the doctrine is not just an idea to believe in, but it's, it's, it's the disposition of the Savior that gives it to us. Let me read you this quote. It says, we are, we are talking about something deeper than the doctrine of eternal security or once saved, always saved. A glorious doctrine, a, clue, a true doctrine, sometimes called the perseverance of the saints. We have come more deeply to the doctrine of the perseverance of the heart of Christ. Yes, professing Christians can fall away, proving that they were never truly in Christ. Yes, once a sinner is united with Christ, there is nothing that can disunite them. But within the skeletal structure of these doctrines, what is the beating heart of God made tangible in Christ? What is most deeply instinctive to him as our sins and sufferings are piling up? What keeps him, Jesus, from growing cold to us? The answer is his heart. The atoning work of Jesus, decreed by the Father and applied by the Spirit, ensures that we are safe eternally. And a text like John 6.37, which we read earlier, reassures us that this is not only a matter of divine decree of God, but of divine desire. He wants to keep you. This is heaven's delight. Come to me, says Christ. I will embrace you into my deepest being. 
and I will never let you go. This is the perseverance of the saints. More, more rightly said, this is the perseverance of Christ in the saints. He never leaves. He never forsakes.